The last part of Lecture 16 concerns thermal energy. The idea of thermal energy is included in the kinetic molecular theory of gases. I have a container with some very tiny gas particles in it. That's because the volume of the particles is negligible compared to the volume of the container. Negligible means very small and can therefore be ignored. The gas particles in the container, therefore, are very far apart. Gas particles are in constant random motion, experiencing elastic collisions. That's because the particles do not interact. And finally, the average kinetic energy of gas particles depends on the absolute temperature. It's related to one-half the mass of the particle times the volume squared. So temperature is a measure of the average kinetic energy of the particles. So we have a name for this average kinetic energy. It's called the thermal energy. And it's roughly proportional to R times T. This time, R will be in units of joules per Kelvin mole with a numeric value of 8.314. The temperature will be an absolute temperature scale, which is Kelvin. And as a reminder, Kelvin is equal to Celsius plus 273.15. The units of average thermal energy are going to be in kilojoules per mole. So what this means is the higher the temperature of a material, the higher the thermal energy of the material. And here's a little animation to give you an idea of at least what's in my head when I think about gases. As the temperature inside the jar decreases, the water vapor molecules move more slowly. And as the temperature increases, the water vapor molecules move more quickly. For us on planet Earth, molecules of air are colliding with us constantly all the time. We experience that as pressure. So a typical room is at 25 degrees Celsius. What is the approximate thermal energy in kilojoules per mole of molecules that are at that temperature? The thermal energy is roughly proportional to R times T. So we will just take the ideal gas law constant, 8.314 joules per Kelvin mole, multiply it by the temperature, which has been adjusted to degrees Kelvin, and then divide by 1,000 joules to convert this into kilojoules. So you notice how all our units cancel out, and we're left with a value of approximately 2.5 kilojoules per mole. This question is for you. Please repeat the process, but this time at 70 degrees Celsius. Now, those of you who've been alert are thinking to yourself, wait a minute. I saw R earlier in this chapter, and it was 0.0821 atmosphere liter per Kelvin mole. Why are there two ideal gas law constants? There aren't. It's just a matter of what units are attached to the numeric value. If I take the PV equal NRT gas law constant, which is in liter atmospheres per Kelvin mole, and I use this conversion factor of 101,325 newtons per meter squared in one atmosphere, and also adjust for the fact that there are 1,000 liters in one cubic meter, Notice what happens when my units cancel out. On the top, I'm left with a Newton meter per Kelvin mole. And a force of one Newton moved through a distance of one meter is a joule. And you notice how with these conversion factors, we've now moved to the 8.314 value that I'm using to estimate thermal energy. So for gas law calculations, 
use the typical units that gases come in and use the 0.0821 to 1 value. For thermal energy calculations, use the 8.314 joules per Kelvin mole. So now that thermal energy has been presented, we can discuss how two different factors determine the state of a material. Thermal energy, which is related to temperature, you can think of as variable and causing vibration in the molecule, causing movement. Whereas interaction energy, these we're going to cover in more detail. They're from intermolecular forces inherent in a molecule due to its structure are non-variable and they're like glue. So thermal energy wants movement. Interaction energy wants things to remain still. And the balance between those two factors will determine the state of a material, whether or not it's solid, liquid, or gas. Interaction energy is fixed for a substance, and if you think back to Coulomb's law, it's actually proportional to charge interactions. The larger the charge is, the greater the interaction energy. So what I have here is sample A, which is sodium chloride. The sodium has a full plus one charge, and it's attracted to the full minus one charge on the chloride ion belonging to a different unit of the compound. B is water and the interactions between water. So we have a partial positive charge of hydrogen attached to a partial negative charge of oxygen. C is a sample of nitrogen, the most common component of our atmosphere. You notice that this nitrogen does not have any indication of a charge, nor does this nitrogen. So if interaction energy is proportional to the energy from charge interaction, which substance has the greatest interaction energy? A plus one attracted to a minus one, a slightly positive attracted to a slightly negative, or no discernible charge, attracted to no discernible charge? Well, of course, it's the sodium chloride. And by the way, what state of matter is sodium chloride at room temperature? It's a solid. Could that be because of the great attraction between the plus and minus charges? Hmm. What state is water in at room temperature? Eh, a liquid. Could that be from the slight attraction between water molecules? Maybe. What state is nitrogen in at room temperature? It's a gas. Could that be due to very little attraction between nitrogen molecules? I think so. Of course, water isn't always a liquid. Although water molecules have interaction energy with one another, the thermal energy can vary. So I have our typical water molecule with a bond angle of approximately 109 degrees and partial charges. If very little thermal energy is available, water is a solid. So when thermal energy is much less than interaction energy, the typical state of matter is a solid. When the two are roughly balanced, we have a liquid. And when you greatly increase thermal energy, we get a gas, which is water vapor. So when interaction energy is much less than thermal energy, then we have a gas. Hopefully that makes sense. So when we have not very much movement and much glue, there is a solid. When we have a large amount of movement, which exceeds the amount of glue, then we have a gas. One statement students often struggle with is chemicals at the same temperature will have the same thermal energy. So if you have a tiny nitrogen molecule, it's going to move around very quickly because it's light. If you have a sugar molecule, it won't move transitionally as much, but it will wobble. So when you think of gases, you might want to think of Usain Bolt zooming quickly from one place to another. And when you think of larger molecules, 
you might want to think of multiple people in a circle dance. Now, both these activities can have the same amount of kinetic energy. When you have a little molecule, this amount of energy will be mostly transitional motion, like Usain Bolt running in a sprint. If you have a big molecule, it might express itself mostly in vibrational motion, which is this circle dance. The people in the dance remain in a circle in the field, but they're still moving. So small molecules go zoom, zoom, zoom. Here's an animation to help us think about that. So I hope you noticed in that animation that the monoatomic gas moved much more quickly transitionally than the diatomic gas. The diatomic gas was also able to express itself by going back and forth along the spring, which represented its covalent bond, as well as spinning around different axes. So how do big molecules express themselves with the same kinetic energy? I describe this as wobble wobble, and I have found another helpful animation to show you what that looks like. Here is a benzene molecule and all the different ways it can wobble wobble. So larger molecules have the ability to expand and contract both their bond length and their bond angles in multiple directions. If we were to consider sodium chloride and nitrogen at room temperature, they would have the same thermal energy. The nitrogen would just express it by zooming about the room and the sodium chloride would express it by slight vibrations in the crystal structure. Even though they have the same thermal energy, their interaction energy is different, so that results in different states of matter. Sodium chloride has great interaction energy between each unit of the ionic compound. Therefore, sodium chloride at room temperature is a solid, because interaction energy is much greater than thermal energy. The nitrogen molecule has very little interaction energy with another molecule. Therefore, it's a gas. And this would be because the thermal energy far exceeds the interaction energy available to the nitrogen molecules. As your last question, I'd like to know which one of these statements is true. How did cookie crisp cereal get chosen? 
when I was making this long ago, one of my children walked by me with a bowl of cookie crisp cereal. And a small hint for you, there are two correct answers, in case you're concerned.